Hello, everybody. I'm here with uh, Roser Corella, and she's the director of Room Without a View. Uh, hello, Roser. How are you? Hello. Good. I'm good. Thanks for the invitation to be part of the program, this program. Of, of course. And thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I, I mean, you have a really insightful, re really interesting documentary. And I'm really excited to talk about that. First mm -hmm. of all, I just want to give some information about Rosa and then we can start. Uh, she was born in Barcelona in 1978. She's an independent documentary filmmaker currently based in Berlin. Rosa began her career as a video journalist for Catalan TV. TV, but her interest in human stories behind global issues moved her to start self-producing and de developing a personal vision within the documentary field. Her work has been shown worldwide, winning numerous awards. Her fascination for the documentary genre has led her to travel the world in search of stories that deserve to be told. Yes. So do you, do you want to add anything else to this information? <laughs> no, thanks for the introduction. It's fine. <laughs> Great. And uh, Room Without So We was another uh, story that I, I guess she found in a in a different world. So can you tell us about the documentary a little bit, Rosa? How come how come you come how you come to tell the story of uh, these women? If you can just give a little information beforehand about the documentary, and later on, I, I'm really curious about how were you inspired to shoot this documentary? Okay, I can make a brief summary. Um, yeah. Well, in, in Lebanon, there's a quarter million of migrant domestic workers, and they are hired um, under what is called kafala system. It means that these women uh, as soon as they step into the country, their parts are confiscated, they require to live in the house of the family they work for, and they don't have any, any right as a worker because they are out of the labor law. And this is a very sad story because this system at the end, uh, what, what makes is promoting uh, abuse and exploitation of these uh, women because families think they, they, this woman is a property, that they can do whatever they want with them and they work for them 24 hours. So it's it's a it's a kind of a modern slavery. This is a bit uh, what is about. It's a very tough topic. Um, I can tell you how I started. Actually, yeah, please. I, yeah. I did another in Bangladesh some years ago. I was there working uh, uh, for another project, and and I discovered that many women were traveling abroad as a domestic worker because of lack of uh, work for women in the country and poverty and many other reasons. So many women just to support the family, they travel abroad thinking that is a great opportunity because uh, all these agencies that uh, uh, recruit uh, this kind of uh, women, they sell them the story like uh, Lebanon is a great opportunity, you will save money, you, you will come back with a lot of money and uh, it will be only three years and all amazing. What happened is they don't have enough information when they arrive in the country, they they find themselves uh, in a prison, locked in the house um, with a, a lot of abuse and without any right to to claim or to defend themselves because uh, they are out of the law. So they, they don't, they are not considered workers. They are considered part of the house. And this is the first uh, basic uh, reason why they they are trapped in this uh, system, abusive and exploitative system. Yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how did you come to uh, decide to shoot uh, this documentary? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true that I started and then I <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and then I was in in Bangladesh and I discovered this topic and I thought, wow, I I started uh, making interviews uh, with the women who had returned to, to Bangladesh after a few years in Lebanon. And I have to say I was shocked because uh, the stories they, they told me were really shocking. Like uh, many of them, for example, they didn't even have a space to, to, to sleep in the house. No, Some of them, they say, no, I was sleeping on the kitchen floor or even in the balcony or I didn't have uh, time to rest. So they, they thought I was... I was a robot. I was working, taking care of the kids and cleaning and and without enough food. So many of them, they end up being sick because they don't have time to rest, no food, um, or they are beaten up. And it was really a horror movie. And uh, 
and I decided, well, this is very important to, to talk about because it's a big business in countries be, between Lebanon and, and between the countries of origin. It's not, in this case, it was Bangladesh, but of course, we are talking about uh, women coming from Africa, from Asia. So it's it's a big, big uh, business. So I decided, my first idea was uh, following some girls who were planning planning to, to travel to Lebanon. But as soon as I arrived in, in Beirut, uh, I realized that it was impossible to follow track because they were locked in the house. Even though I had the contact of the, some relatives and I tried to keep contact with them, uh, most of them, they didn't have, uh, they, the families didn't allow them to, to use the phone to communicate with families. So imagine with me, no, it was really uh impossible so in lebanon i decided to 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 change a bit the the my idea and open up the story also with other women with other nationalities like african and uh and this is how i i started but it was a really long process because you can imagine that uh, having the access uh to the families was uh, very tough yeah yeah, yeah, of course. And also, it was really interesting in the commentary, we hear that even uh, the in Lebanon, even the families don't have much money, they still want to have a maid uh, to clean and to cook. It's like, uh, I mean, in most countries, when you're wealthy, yeah, you can you can just hire someone to help you with the house. And uh, if you don't have enough money, you probably do the work for, by yourself. But it at there it's like some kind of uh, uh like you must have it i mean uh, they really want to have it even they don't really have the money it's what what was the reason for that How, what what did you learn about that yeah. I mean, it's kind of a cultural thing i guess right yeah yeah exactly it's a mix i mean having a domestic worker a 24 hours domestic worker is a symbol of a status of course yeah, in, exactly. in lebanon but because um it's very it's affordable because it's very cheap having a for example uh hiring a domestic worker from bangladesh it costs only 150 dollars per month which is really i mean nothing for many families in in lebanon well now with the economic crisis Prices is different, but uh, for many years it has been something very affordable. And mm -hmm. we have to having in mind also that depending on nationalities, the salary is set. So yeah. it's a culture and it's a society very racist, and they base the salary uh, depending on the skin color. And um, the, for example, the women from Philippines have a, the better salary because they are the, they have a whiter skin and they can speak English. So. Uh, the salary is set in uh, $400 per month. And then there are the, Bang the Africans, the Bangladeshis, and Bangladeshis, actually, they are the, the cheapest one. But then we are talking of, uh, yeah, salaries between 150 to 200 300 So it's affordable, not, as you said, it's not only uh, the higher classes, but also middle and, middle and lower classes. But what happened that when a family that couldn't afford actually in another society, let's say this domestic worker, they can do it. And they had here this woman, but normally the flat where they live is not big enough. Yeah. So the domestic worker end up sleeping on the kitchen floor because also it's a house that is a middle class house, uh, smaller than it would be in a house of a higher family. So it's a chain of uh, problems. And sometimes also what happens is that if they cannot afford it, they don't pay her. They also, there's uh, total impunity for uh, the family. The law protects uh, first the families and the agencies than the domestic workers. So in many cases, I interviewed many women who told me I was working for one year and I didn't get any, any, yeah. uh, nothing, any salary, nothing. Or they go back to the countries with empty hands and they don't have the right to complain. Sometimes when they go to the police, if they can, uh, the police send them back home or the family end up uh, lay, lying, saying like, no, the domestic worker was uh, stealing money. And the police believe the story of the family before and it's the domestic worker who end up in jail. And many, many cases like this, that is, I mean, I was in shock, no? And because they cannot defend themselves, the family is saying, okay, if I don't pay, who, who cares, no? Nothing is going to happen yeah. to me. So it, it, it becomes really a, 
in many cases um, a problem of human trafficking because at yeah. the end women arrive in Lebanon without information without the working conditions and they are end up trapped in a house without the salary and being as enslaved so it's, it's really like it's human rights problem. violation in every aspect i mean it's it's uh, it's devastating a devastating totally. situation yeah. i i want to talk about the political mm-hmm. and legal legal legality side of the situation actually i think it's really mm-hmm. important to someone to know their rights and if they are signing a contract uh, it's really important for them to know what they are signing i guess of course they are desperate and they need Uh, money and they need to help their families but also i think there is a lack of knowledge right lack of knowledge that uh, what are their rights and what they are uh, prevented uh, what which rights they are prevented at so i think it's also really important can we talk about that side of like uh, they don't even know that uh, there is such a thing in the kafala system and they're like in a way present by the system right Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is also a big issue, and uh, uh, I was in, of course, in, in in contact with many organizations of human rights that they are working to to improve the rights of domestic workers, but for them it's really like uh, fighting against the wall sometimes, no? Because uh, they try to to work with the Ministry of Labor to work on uh, writing together the contract with the basic rights like having a day off per week, maximum working hours. Um, the payment, uh, well, basic conditions, and the Ministry of Labor agree to to write this draft together. And officially, this is the contract that exists. The problem is that nobody applies the contract. So when you talk with the Ministry of Labor, they say, "No, look, they have a good conditions, and the kafala system is made to protect their rights, and blah blah blah." So officially, the system is good. I mean, uh-huh. it, there's nothing written like. Uh, Okay, don't this woman can work twenty uh, four hours for you. She doesn't need to eat. She doesn't need to take. I mean, of course, it's not written officially. Everything is good, but what happened? Nobody applied, and nobody is controlling what happened in the private space of the house. That is also another problem. That because yeah. it's not um, normal work in a public space, it's very difficult to control what's happening behind the walls of a house. No, yeah. and. Another thing is like uh, the women arrived, they sign a contract in Arabic that normally when they arrive, they don't speak Arabic. So they are signing something that they don't understand. And this contract is just a paper that they don't see anymore. So it's not that they have a copy of the contract and they can go to, uh, I don't know, to the Ministry of Labor and say, look, I signed this and these are not the conditions. So it's really... Um, I mean, it's really a, a really frustrating situation no? that they, they really cannot complain to anyone. Now only they have the NGOs, but the NGOs are, I mean, working when these women are, are able to go out of the house and talk with them. Because if not, when they are trapped, they, they feel lonely, they don't know the country, they don't know the rules, they don't know what to do, and they don't even have the right to break the contract. If they don't feel well, if they, there's an abuse, they don't even have the right to say, look, I'm, I don't like this work, I'm leaving. Because it's written yeah. in the contract that the family is the one, the only one with the right to, to, to finalize the contract if there's a problem. But the worker not. So she has to accept the conditions, even though are the worst ones. It's uh, terrible, really. It's... Yeah. And what do you think the solution is to the situation? How can this situation be uh sold entirely do you think is it possible well the first solution of course the first step is abolish the kafala system this is the yeah. the, the, the monster i mean this is the system is the first step um and then for example it happened because kafala system exists also in other countries in the uh, and for example two years ago qatar abolished the kafala system that was an example it's possible but it means making a I mean, after the kafala system, it means a huge um, changing of implementing uh, working visas for these women. Mm-hmm. And this is something that Lebanon doesn't want because kafala system, they control the, the period of a stay. They just want the rotating uh, short-term uh, workers. 
they want to to be sure that these women after three years they go back to their countries they don't want them to stay no uh, and this is another problem if you give a working visa to a bangladeshi woman maybe she finds a job she meets someone she gets married you know she she established in Lebanon that would be normal in uh, many other countries. Yeah. But in this sense, with the kafala system, they don't have any right. Even if they have kids, these kids are illegal in the country. So this is another problem. If because they are illegal, then they cannot go to school. So in uh, how the situation uh, is uh, worse and worse. No. But the solution would be first step: abolishing the kafala system, including uh, domestic work in the labor law giving rights as a normal worker in the country and and then uh, of course um, start working on the rights of these women not just protecting the families and the agencies and yeah, yeah that would be and also yeah yeah and I think in the political aspect then they don't want to uh, spend money on these women they don't want to like you said give any kind of nationality uh, probability to them they just want them to work and just go back so uh, first of all uh, there has to be a really really big policy changes in order to do this uh, oh, in the right way I guess and also uh, in the documentary we, we see that these women kind of form a union and they started to just inform uh, each other about the situation right there is started to record mm -hmm. uh, some I guess radio or some kind of podcast uh, uh, recordings so the other woman who came to country or maybe thinking to come to country will listen and they they'll know what they're going to face or if they're if they're already in Lebanon they will know that how can they uh, have better conditions? How can they protect themselves, right? I think it's really important mm -hmm. to just uh, to gather around and start to uh, spread the right kind of knowledge. Yeah, that's the first also, I mean, second step, let's say, no? First would be abolishing the Kampala system and yeah. second, or at the same time, giving the proper information in the country of origins, like, because if not, also, even the domestic world, the women, when they call home, they don't want to worry their families. And always they say, no, everything is going yeah. well. I'm earning money. Blah, blah, blah. No, all of us, you go to these families to, to not work. So the, the information is not arriving properly to the country of origin. And I, I met some NGOs in Bangladesh that they, they were trying to make this campaign of informing people, but it's not enough. And also, um, for example, of course, the agency is recruiting people. They don't want to give this information because, of course, it's a business. So that would be another thing. But it's true that uh, since I started the documentary until the end, that it, it was like uh, some years I work on it. I have to say that I saw many, many uh, educational programs and and uh, the initiatives from the NGOs were uh, uh, growing and, and being stronger. And, for example, this is a theater piece that you see in the documentary yeah yeah uh, this was uh made in a university and it I, I think that that was very interesting this educational program because they made this um theater piece and they were touring like uh going from universities or schools and it was in a uh, theater play so they they created the situation like the normal situation that uh and problems that the domestic worker face in the house and then the audience in this case the students they were uh, proposing how to change the situation. Not what, how, how, how they would improve every situation that is problematic. And then the actors and the actresses, uh, they try to to play a game again, the theater piece with the ideas of the students. It was very yeah. interesting. Because yeah, it was great. They, they were part of this um, idea of changing the mentality. No. And and then the uh, the actors were trying to to implement let's say this idea, but then another problem uh, was happening. No, I mean it was very interesting because it was a way of uh, playful uh, to to make the students think about it and and to change the mentality of the young people in Lebanon. This is very important. If you grow up in a family where you see that your parents are abusing the domestic worker, you will do it because you think it's normal yeah. to beat up your domestic worker, no? Uh, yeah. And some domestic workers uh, told me, you cannot imagine the kids. The kids were beating me up. I mean, 
it's like uh, you have to educate your kids in respect, no? respecting this person who's living in the house, uh, treating her as another person, like a part at the end, part of the family somehow, even though she's working, of course, but not like a furniture or like, uh, I don't know, or an animal. Sometimes she's, they said they treat me worse than the dog. So I don't know. This is You have to start also with education, no? changing the mentality of the, of the youth. And uh, I don't know, It's uh, the change will come with uh, working in many levels, political level, education, uh, implementation of the rights from the agencies that uh, recruit people. I mean, this is a really uh, a complex uh, work to change things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah mm -hmm. It's the same for the many things. So I hope, I hope in Lebanon this, this situation will not continue after years and after years. I hope there will be some yeah. difference and it is really important making a documentary such as this so that people can uh, just watch it and spread it and know about it so thank you so much for being here with us today again Roser thank <laughs> and thank you for uh, all this knowledge and thank you for this documentary also I hope the audience will learn a lot after they watch your documentary thank you for the invitation and for the interview <laughs> Yeah, and I hope to just <laughs> encounter with you good luck another with this, time. Uh, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.